AA Beyond Belief is a podcast for, by, and about people who have found a secular path to recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. Hello, today I'll be speaking with Eric Haynes, who is a public health advocate in Canada. I learned about him from an article he wrote that was posted on AA Agnostica not that long ago. It was entitled, We the North, Rethinking Addiction and Recovery in Canada. And that was a follow-up to a previous blog post that was on William White's site, um, which was entitled, A Canadian Perspective on Recovery Advocacy. Eric, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm. I was looking forward to this for a long time. Um, I, I just found this topic to be interesting. I guess I first got interested in what was going on in Canada and the differences between what's happening in Canada and the United States. Oh, from an interview I had with actually a comedian who was originally from Vancouver and moved to Toronto, and he was telling, educating me about the safe injection sites that were popping up in Vancouver first and then moved over to Toronto. And that's something that's unique to Canada, you know, that doesn't happen in the United States. And I thought that was really interesting, the difference, but that that, that would be tolerated and accepted in Canada, but not in the United States at all. And there's just got to be a huge difference there. But what if you don't mind, Eric, could, could you kind of just start this conversation by introducing yourself as a public health advocate you know, what exactly is that and how did you get involved with it? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess, uh, first off, I mean, like all of your listeners, I mean, how I got involved in the recovery space, uh, I mean, is, you know, I pretty much grew up in recovery. I mean, I just start off like by saying that, um, you know, being an advocate uh, for me has also been working also on my own recovery and having honest conversations with people in my community and, um, you know, over the course of my life now, uh, you know, in terms of doing my own self care and, and, uh, helping other people along this journey too. So, I mean, discovering your site and obviously a agnostica, uh, and the, you know, the whole secular recovery movement, um, you know, I've been following this online and, and I've been a huge, um, um, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm just a fan of what you guys are up to. Um, in terms of, you know, in terms of public health per se, I mean, along with kind of growing up in recovery and being involved in pretty much all the recovery um, uh, mutual aid groups, I mean, I also grew up in the uh, the YMCA and, um, yeah. Um, and I worked for the YMCA for over 10 plus years. Uh, while I was going back to university. Uh, so I was heavily involved, I guess, in the area of community development and, uh, you know, recovery mutual aid uh, groups, you know, whether they be secular, AA or NA or even the Al-Anon groups uh, were groups that were always around the YMCA, <laughs> uh, renting out our spaces, having their conferences. Uh, so, you know, it, it was just, uh, you know, I, I just pretty much lived and breathed in those types of environments growing up. Uh, so that's pretty much how I got involved. Uh, and over the course of, I guess, academically, ironically, uh, I ended up at Concordia University, which is kind of a, an outgrowth of the YMCA in Montreal, which is an interesting history in itself. But I landed up in the kind of a, a bit of a strange department called the Applied Human Science Department. And the Applied Human Science Department essentially is, uh, you know, it's an area of specialization for a lot of people that are, you know, go into the, uh, the health sciences. Uh, so I was surrounded by psychologists, sociologists, uh, people that work in the area of community development and nonprofit organizations like the YMCA or work specifically in the area of public health. Uh, so I was kind of, you know, uh, groomed, I guess <laughs> if you can say, and I, I, you know, and, uh, in that direction from a, from a career standpoint. And uh, I've just been involved now for over 20 plus years now in terms of doing that kind of work. Okay. So, um, ha so you've noticed a, a difference or a growth or I don't know, um, some sort of a evolvement of, uh, recovery advocacy in Canada over the last several years. 
Um, can you talk about that? What what is going on with recovery advocacy in Canada? Sure. I mean, well, I mean, even just what's going on with you guys, I mean, in terms of starting the secular A movement, um, you know, has been a huge change, uh, game changer. I mean, not only in Canada, but obviously in the U.S. And, um, you know, I've been following that closely as well um, in terms of the evolution of how that's that's been kind of going on. Um, It's fascinating, actually. It is actually fascinating. It is. And what's amazing about it is uh, it's actually this whole secular AA movement, if, if we want to call it that, has been going on for a long time. I mean, it started back in 1975. We've had these groups. But what is really interesting, there was one event that happened, in my opinion, that really um, helped us along. And that was when we all came together in 2014 in Santa Monica, California, for our international conference. So this was really interesting because this is, I think, the first time that atheists and agnostics and Alcoholics Anonymous got together in one place. And not just from North America, but from other countries around the world as well. And we, so we, we got to know each other and we got to know what we had in common and our differences. But beyond that, we connected afterwards and stayed connected through social media and our websites online. And from that, man, we have just been growing like the number of meetings secular meetings and so forth and new people are finding us and learning about these secular meetings all the time so it's really cool how that technology combined with our face-to-face interactions kind of um solidified this growth i think in our secular movement no, oh, absolutely. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk to you. <laughs> uh, you know, I was super excited to go and connect with Roger as well. And I mean, and now, you know, through technology, exactly like you say, I mean, we're able to go and connect with each other and share, you know, not only our own personal stories of recovery, but also, you know, in terms of how things are evolving, how things are changing and how we're adapting as communities, uh, you know, now all across Canada, but how you guys are doing it as well in the States. And it's this story that's it's really started to captivate me, uh, you know, and that's what led me to go and write my original essay that I sent to uh, to Bill White, um, you know. And if your listeners are not that familiar, I'm pretty sure like quite a few of them are familiar with Bill White's work. Um, I mean, he's uh, he's been an inspiration for me. I mean, his writing has been um, uh, it just really opened up my eyes in terms of of how recovery over the years or as a movement has been evolving and adapting and has always been at the forefront of, of, uh, of health really, um, you know, and helping people to go out and uh, uh, possibly even just adapt, I think, to, uh, you know, what's going on in the modern world right now. Um, so that's what led me to, to go out and write those particular pieces. And, um, you know, and I was happy to reach out to, um, to Roger over at uh, AA Agnostica. And, uh, you know, we've had the opportunity now to exchange just a few emails. And we've Skyped once before as well now. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the conversation was amazing. Uh, you know, he's, he's, you know, he, he, uh, he taught me a lot in terms of what's going on with uh, what you guys are doing in terms of, um, uh, the secular movement, but we were also able to go and exchange, you know, some of our experiences, uh, you know, over the years in terms of participating in, you know, AA and, uh, for me, it was also NA as well. Um, and Al-Anon, uh, you know, and seeing how all these mutual aid support groups, um, have been, uh, have been adapting and changing over the years and, you know, uh, adopting a new form of language, uh, that is seems to be moving in the direction, you know, of of um, a modern uh, secular approach, um, and um, you know, and that to me is fascinating. I, I you know, I think that's really one interesting dimension that's going on. But it's also, you know, how these various uh, you know mutual aid support groups, whether it be AA or NA, and how they're they're talking to one another now. Uh, you know, because um, I have a lot of friends in, uh, in NA and here in Montreal, and I mean, they, you know, there's a lot of people that are jumping from one fellowship to the other, right? And they're exchanging their experience, strength, and hope, and how, uh, you know, whether it be from the literature or even just from their experience, and how that's 
morphing and changing how people are recovering today or how we are talking about recovery or how we are actually talking about uh, addiction. Isn't that interesting? You know, sometimes I feel like AA in particular, which I'm most familiar with, and when I say AA, it's kind of a complicated thing because AA is really thousands of different little groups. <laughs> but but when you when you look at the, the way that AA likes to um, be structured, I guess, or organized, you think that it's kind of siloed because they only want to talk about alcoholism and they only want to have you know this you know this approach, whatever. But what's really happening is people are mixing and matching, you know, uh, and there are more options today too: smart recovery, life ring, uh, different approaches like that. So people can go to an AA meeting. They can also go to a smart recovery meeting at the same time. And yeah. And so from that is, is coming a whole new, I guess, um, I, idea about what recovery is. It's not necessarily just isolated to just one idea in one 12 step fellowship. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, and people that have experiences with treatment as well, right? I mean, people that are walking out of formal treatment rather than some people that are, you know, like personally, I've never gone to treatment. I mean, my recovery has been more of a, a form of a natural recovery, I guess you can go and say in terms of my own natural pathway. Um, but, uh, you know, I needed that support, right? I needed to be able to go and reach out to other people and have conversations and, and, and hear uh, other people's experience, strength, and hope, and, and you know, and how they, you know, they were uh, changing and growing, and how they were adapting to the times, um, you know. And, and that even that is is just a strange thing that you know Bill White has written about quite a bit. I mean, he's written quite a few papers on the idea of recovery identity or, or various recovery identities, um, you know, and how people go and fall into various pathways. Um, you know, and you know, all of a sudden, you know, from a kind of scientific or maybe from a sociological or even from a cultural standpoint, uh, you know, we're getting to the point now where we're kind of reflecting back on this history or we're trying to jot down this history. And through the process, we seem to be learning, right? Um, and that's changing, you know, uh, everything. I mean, it's changing the political discourse in Canada in terms of how we're thinking, or, you know, about healthcare and mental health. Uh, that's, you know, even just like you beautifully said, uh, you know, at the beginning of uh, your intro there, I mean, in terms of harm reduction, I mean, harm reduction now is a new player um, in, in this space as well, right? And how they're interacting and dealing or having conversations with people within the mutual aid, um, you know, uh, whether it be AA or NA, people that have, have experience there, how they're interacting with them and, you know, it's creating a sort of, 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 of new language, and what's really evolving out of that, and something I kind of touched on a bit on in the um, uh, my article, was is that you know it's this general idea of there seems to be a, a continuum of recovery care, or in the states right now, I guess through Bill White's work and stuff like that, he re referred to as a recovery oriented theory of care, uh, which he worked on with uh, with Ernie Kurtz. And that's had a huge impact, uh, you know, on quite a people, quite a few people and thinkers, or even you know, people that are working professionally in the addiction treatment space to go and start adopting that model. How has how has all of this impacted the public policy debates, particularly in Canada? Uh, well, I mean, that's the fascinating thing that's going on right now. I mean, it's uh, you know, from a public policy standpoint, I mean, the, the, it's pretty much agreed upon, I guess, you know, like uh, at a, a higher level in terms of policy, whether it be government or people that are working within the addiction treatment space, um, they've fully adopted, I guess, a, a kind of a continuum of care model or recovery oriented theory of care model. But the question is, is, you know, how do we go and implement this? Right. Uh, and that's where things get very c complicated is, you know, it's like it, it, this looks good and it sounds great on paper. But how do we go out and, uh, you know, finance this, uh, you know, and where, where exactly do some of these other players or stakeholders come in and fit in? Um, so there's been, it's been pretty, <laughs> you know, I guess like anything political, I mean, it can get pretty, um, 
uh, pretty nasty. Uh, you know, if you're following the news right now in Canada, uh, you know, the harm reduction uh, folks uh, can go, you know, uh, they're, they're pretty vocal and political in terms of how they want to go and tackle, uh, you know, the opioid addiction crisis. But then you have people, you know, more on the recovery side, where there'd be more in terms of uh, mutual aid recovery support groups, which are much more grassroots. Um, you know, they have their own view, worldview and perspective in terms of how to go to go about that. And usually, it's been more of an abstinence-based sort of model. Um, what I find interesting, we, though, is that you're even having that debate, that which doesn't seem to be occurring here, as far as I know. <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's quite, I mean, I'm, I've been, you know, like I'm on Twitter and I've been following quite a bit of, of research online as well, uh, you know, over the years. I mean, Bill White has been really, you know, one of the avant-garde sort of thinkers in pushing that during the 90s. Uh, but there's a, quite a few organizations in the U.S. itself. Um, you know, Dr. Um, uh, Kelly from the uh, Recovery Research Institute, who's up in uh, Massachusetts, has been doing some phenomenal work in that space. Um, and, you know, they've been grooming quite a bit of, uh, of scholars and uh, new people uh, over the years that have been, um, uh, you know, they're doing their master's degree in social work or in psychology. And, uh, you know, there's a whole mind shift uh, happening um, in, in the higher education um, that it seems to be adopting this new worldview. Uh, or this new way or, or methodology of going about, you know, uh, tackling, you know, what is addiction and what is recovery. Um, so, I, I, you know, it, even though, I mean, in Canada, maybe, because uh, that's kind of even been my own impression as well, is that, you know, looking over to the states at times, I felt, well, you know, th they seem to be moving in the right direction, right? They've adopted this kind of recovery-oriented theory of care, uh, theory and it seems to be taking off and the recovery advocacy movement um, that was being advocated by Bill White and Ernie Kurtz at the time uh, during the 90s and into the early 2000s really seemed like it was you know a big wave uh, of change that was coming um, and it did I mean it, 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 it caused quite a stir uh, but at the same time I mean uh, you know the crisis has been getting worse on certain levels as well uh, so in Canada, we've we've mixed and played with two models, really. Um, and if you go back to, uh, you know, kind of the uh, my article there, I mean, there's a few, um, like Dr. Uh, McPherson, um, I mean, I would probably say he's probably the leading thinker right now or has been at the forefront of the, uh, the harm reduction approach in Canada. Um, and he's been doing that for, you know, pretty much over his whole career. And I think that's why we've had so much success in terms of going out and implementing um, you know, harm reduction uh, approach along with, you know, uh, recovery-based initiatives in Canada. Is there uh, a but, difference um, between how that's viewed in, like, say, Vancouver as opposed to Toronto? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And even just that is fascinating. Um, you know, like, I, I, um, you, like, you know, one of your guests on your, your podcast was uh, uh, Ray, uh, Dr. Um, uh, I can't remember his last name. Uh, <laughs> Baker. Uh, Ray Baker, exactly, yeah. Uh, and Ray is out in, um, in BC, and he's done some phenomenal work, um, you know, in terms of the area of recovery or taking on a kind of a recovery-oriented theory of care approach, um, right? And he's right at the heart of Vancouver, and he's been in BC, you know, fighting, uh, you know, uh, fighting tooth and nail with harm reduction folks, uh, to going out and winning that battle. Uh, but in, uh, you know, in, in Quebec or in, even in Montreal, I mean, it's, it's a completely different uh, reality. Um, you know, from even just from the opioid crisis, we haven't have, you know, we just haven't been hit as hard as, uh, as Ontario or British Columbia. Um, you know, and there's a big cultural and linguistic difference uh, that I tried to go and, and draw out a bit as well in, in my article. Um, you know, but I, it's it's not clear, I think, in terms of, you know, why why is that, why has it happened that way? You know, what are the reasons why, uh, you know, uh, various forms of substance use uh, disorders or even various, uh, you know, issues or, uh, you know, um, uh, community-based issues have flared up in various areas and they haven't flared up in other areas across the country. 
Yeah, that is interesting. I and and I I and I know that even here in the states there are some areas of the country that are harder hit from the opioid crisis than others. And when I look back at different epidemics, I guess you call them, like crack epidemic and then there was meth at one time, those were also there were also some regional differences. I live in Missouri for example, and Missouri was like one of the leading states for uh, meth, amphetamine uh, production and addiction and problems. And it was um, it was just all over. I mean, every other day you would hear about a meth lab getting raided or blowing up or something. But how interesting that that was like here in Missouri and like in some other part of the country, it wasn't as big of a deal. And then you get into the opioid situation, and that seems like it started like um, – in like Vermont or something and then kind of um, spread it um, over to other areas. It's just, uh, I don't know how that happens. Why yeah. some areas. Well, um, I mean, even, even, I mean, even now, I mean, that's what I kind of love listening to, uh, you know, to you guys in terms of when you guys reflect back on the history of AA mm-hmm. is, you know, in terms of how the history, uh, you know, or how AA grew, right. I mean, you know, how it grew from various cities and then eventually got carried over to other parts of the, you know, the country and then eventually made its way up into Canada. And now it's, you know, it's a fully, you know, it's a, it's an international movement now. I mean, A can go and be found in, you know, in dozens of countries, you know, hundreds of countries now almost. Um, and it's the same thing with a, uh, NA. I mean, NA's history is a fascinating history once you start to get into it in terms of who some of the key players were and how they transmitted um, you know, one, I just like, how, how does recovery get transmitted from one individual to another in a certain way, or how is it kind of, um, you know, uh, I, one of my favorite books actually by, um, by Bill White is actually called, um, pathways, um, from the culture of addiction to the c- culture of recovery. And in that book, he, he basically analyzes, you know, in terms of how, you know, addiction and recovery, uh, can go and be passed on. Right. Uh, through various cultural means or it could be through various institutions or it could be through various, you know, economic reasons in terms of how, you know, on drugs or alcohol uh, come to go and play out in terms of how these things manifest and take, you know, take root in our communities. And even just why or, you know, why is there flare ups of people using substances or mind altering substances at various periods in history? I mean, that is a fascinating question to go and explore and, you know, in terms of of why. Uh, And, you know, and there's been a lot of literature now that it's been written on AA. I mean, Ernie Kurtz is probably one of the most famous. And, I mean, if you go and read his history of of, of AA, I mean, one of the the roots causes uh, seems to be the Great Depression. Right. I mean, Bill W. was, you know, trying to go and make his way in the world during that particular period in history. And, uh, you know, some people can't or maybe, you know, we need to go and integrally look kind of how history and community and various, um, you know, events uh, go and shape, you know, uh, shape us. Yeah. Right. I used to think that the Great Depression had a lot to do with shaping AA, too, because, um, I mean, most everybody was broke <laughs> and and and, the, and they had they had to kind of um they had to kind of come they had to kind of come together and help each other you know um and i i do think that 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 did have a lot to do with um with the how aa was kind of shaped and formed um so but i was i, I also oh, yeah. find it interesting i was reading something oh about some i I'm not going to be able to articulate this very well, but how Bill Wilson's Bill Wilson, when he would write about his, um, the problem of alcoholism, especially as it would relate to people's jobs and so forth and, or his inability to find work in this kind of thing. It's like, he always kind of left out the fact that they were in the middle of a great depression too, you know, that, (laughs) that a lot of, a lot of the problems that they were having, economically about, you know, being able to find work and so forth. I'm sure that their, their alcoholism had a lot to do with it, but there just wasn't a lot of work to be found at that time, you know, oh, absolutely. and that probably contributed yeah. to the drinking as well. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, in just in terms of, I mean, from a, a family standpoint, 
um, you know, in terms of how, you know, having worked for the YMCA in the area of community development for a number of years, I mean, one of the, the biggest impacts is, is how does this actually go out and impact families, All right? And uh, if you, you know, and even in terms of my own personal story of recovery, I mean, um, I, one of the main reasons why I ended up in recovery is that, I mean, there was a, you know, a catastrophic sort of event that, you know, that struck my family. And it was my brother who passed away of uh, childhood leukemia. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, it, that's part of my recovery story. Um, but it was, a, you know, it was a big event that happened to us as a family. Um, you know, I kind of call it the, the uh, you know, the bomb that went off in our living room and, you know, and, and left, left us completely shattered and, um, you know, lost uh, and struggling for a number of years. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, and at the time we were, you know, to, to go out and try and grieve that particular event and, you know, and having to go back into the world and, you know, make our way in terms of, you know, financially keeping, keeping a roof over our head and, um, you know, and, uh, just doing our day-to-day chores. You know, Eric, it's really uh, in interesting of- how that is a common theme of a lot of the stories that I've heard over the years on this podcast is something that happens in the family, a death in particular, um, some sort of a tragedy that really tears the family apart. And, you know, it's not like sometimes you think that if there's a death in the fam, death in the family, that it brings people together, but a lot of times it doesn't. And that was, that was, that was the situation with me. Uh, Part of my story was a suicide in my family, my mother's suicide, and it totally tore my family apart. And my drinking escalated from from that point for the next five years to where it was, you know, you know, it got to the point where I really couldn't function um, in the world with my drinking. And I think about other people I know who have also had, you know, a brother or a sister die in the family, something along those lines. And it just kind of changed the family dynamics. Oh, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and we know as well, I mean, I, clearly, I mean, with your experience and stuff like that of being in program, uh, you know, for this many years, I mean, we know that it's an intergenerational form of trauma, right? That, I mean, and it's not just trauma, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it creates a sort of meaning crisis in our lives, right? And uh, when we connect and we take time and we we rediscover that in in fellowship that we're not alone and we can go and start to put, you know, our story back together or try to go and derive some kind of meaning from from what's what's gone on in our own personal lives. That's how we heal and recover. And that's how we regain hope again. Um, And that that storytelling, that kind of oral storytelling is, is a huge, huge part, I think, in terms of of the evolution of, of what's going on and how things are adapting and changing to now. I mean, uh, we're becoming more and more aware of some of these consequences. And I think we're becoming a lot braver in terms of bringing them out, uh, bringing these issues out into the open and talking about them openly. Um, but I mean, this change and this awareness, I mean, it just seems to take generations, right? I mean, if you think about, you know, where AA started about in the early kind of 20th century, you know, we're at the beginning of the 21st century, you know, it's, it's a fascinating story in terms of, 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 uh, you know, possibly, you know, some people might even say maybe our own evolution <laughs> as, as, as communities, as individuals and, uh, you know, as nations in terms of how we're trying to, you know, figure things out, you, you know? know, something that I've been thinking about recently, um, in connection to AA in a way is this whole idea that, um, people in recovery, especially people in long-term recovery should kind of come out of the darkness and, and, mm. I, and I think this this whole idea of anonymity in AA, I think I, I guess I can understand a, a, oh, a purpose behind it, why they had it. But so many of us who've been sober for decades never talk about it. And it just seems to me like if people that have overcome addiction and have been clean and sober for a long period of time, if they would be more open about it, it would make it easier for people who are seeking help for the first time or struggling with addiction now to not be so stigmatized by it. I, I don't know. Oh, I'm just kind of, I'm thinking along those lines now more and more. Cause I've been, you know, I've been sober for 31 years and I keep, I keep my recovery very quiet 
and I'm really mm -hmm. questioning that now. Why, you know, um, why shouldn't people at work know that? I guess it's, I guess I don't want to be, I don't want that to be my sole identity, but um, I don't know. It's like if, if you've recovered from anything else, it's like you wouldn't try to hide that somewhere in the closet. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, and even for me, I mean, that's been, um, uh, you know, part of my own recovery journey. Uh, a difficult question to go out and, and uh, uh, to address, right? I mean, for a lot of time, you know, the, it, I wasn't supposed to go out and talk about any of this. But like you beautifully said, I mean, you know, the, the stronger I feel or, you know, the more hope and courage that I kind of got my own recovery, the, uh, you know, the more I realized that I wanted to go and share this story with other people, that my fellowship was expanding when I went out and shared my story with other people. I, um, I think and, that by and, doing that, you're lifting people up. You're lifting those up who can't speak for themselves now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, that, and that's an interesting thing, too, about the, uh, the recovery advocacy movement in, in itself, um, you know, that I try to go and talk about or I mean, some people refer to it as the recovery movement. Um, and I mean, that's something that uh, Bill White as well has written quite a bit about, um, you know, and, and it's just this idea that there seems to be this conscious uh, awakening or even political mobilization of people in recovery now that are that are willing to go out and kind of, you know, like you said, kind of come out of the closets and willing to go out and put their face, you know, mm -hmm. uh, out in public and say that, you know, this was an issue that I, I you know, that I struggled with. And today, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a contributing member of society and, you know, I've, I've regained, you know, my strength and, uh, you know, I'm actually stronger from uh, that experience. Um, and th those transformational stories as well is something that, uh, I, and I'm sure you've seen, you know, over the course of your experience in AA, uh, you know, th there really is this, this radical transformation of people, um, you know, from the, 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 the moment they walk into the room to, you know, uh, whether it be three, four years later in their recovery, they really are completely, uh, new individuals, um, and it's, it's, that is, you know, a beautiful thing to go out and watch as well. It is. Uh, and it, it, I was thinking on Facebook nowadays, oftentimes people that are celebrating like a milestone of their recovery, they will often post a picture of themselves while they were using compared to a picture of themselves like three years sober or four years sober. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that too is, is, uh, you know, how technology, yeah. uh, is changing this whole conversation as well as an amazing one. Like, I mean, the, the last podcast that I actually listened to you, uh, of, of yours was actually, um, uh, Joe C actually speaking at one of the, I think it was the, um, Kansas city, yeah, I guess it was some sort of celebration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and listening to his journey is, is an amazing, I mean, right. I mean, he's been involved for so long, uh, and he's seen how the, the fellowships have evolved, how, you know, society is changing and how, uh, you know, people view themselves in recovery now has been changing. Um, and it, maybe it is maybe a bit of a generational thing <laughs> as well. Uh, I've noticed that quite a bit in terms of, you know, for myself, I, I've noticed there's a bit of a generational divide from uh, people that go into NA versus people that stay in A. Um, like my stepdad was, he's a long time. He was like a big time traditional kind of A kind of guy. I mean, he's, he's, he had 20 years uh, sobriety. But I mean, he was kind of the way <laughs> you guys kind of go out and characterize him in terms of, you know, he was a big A, a big book thumper uh, <laughs> in terms of how he went out and viewed it. And there was a particular way in terms of going out and uh, viewing the steps and viewing the traditions. And this, there was a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it, right? Uh, uh, and I've experienced that as well, right? I mean, like in terms of uh, how that's changed. Um, and even just some of the literature now, I mean, um, it, you know, like uh, in NA specifically, I mean, they came up with a sort of a, a new big book. Um, and, you know, so you're seeing an evolution of some of the literature going on now, too, as well, which I find fascinating to go and, and talk about and, and, uh, and see, uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, my own exploration into these things. I'm glad that NA did that. You know, I, I'm not that familiar with NA and I didn't know that they did that. Um, I don't know if that will ever happen in AA 
they the the love of the big book is just so intense. I mean, good God. But um, but 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 what Joe, um, you mentioned Joe uh, C talks about sometimes though is that doesn't matter because we're writing our own books anyway, and you can, <laughs> exactly <laughs> you can go to Amazon and you can find almost any kind of recovery book you want written by AA members, you know, um, about how they view the program from various you know um, points of view, whether it be secular or spiritual or whatever. So there is a lot of that, a lot out there now. Um, gosh. And even just like what you guys are doing in terms of a free thinker kind of secular based approach to the, the, to the program, uh, you know, I think is, is a fa- fascinating twist to what's happened. Right. Um, and like you guys say, I mean, there was always these agnostic free thinkers, uh, um, you know, in, in the program itself, who didn't believe in God and that, you know, it was more of a question possibly of fellowship or whatever the, you know, the reasons for going out and sticking around and, and, uh, you know, stopping drinking or whatever the case may be. But I mean, even the fact that you guys have done that, I mean, Montreal just has, and I should probably give a shout out. I probably have some friends that might actually go out and listen to the podcast. I mean, there's now a secular NA group here in Montreal. Oh, really? An NA group? Yeah. And an anchor, yeah. Uh, second, oh, wow. I mean, cool. Yeah, yeah. And I know that there's also a secular. Fired. There's a secular AA group in in Mont in uh, outside of Montreal also. Uh, what's the name of the city? I won't remember. I won't even be able to pronounce the name, but it's not far outside of Montreal. Yeah, there's. A, I think there might be a few secular uh, AA groups in the area of Montreal, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I mean, the communications that I've had with people in the secular uh, A movement have mostly been online. I mean, I've communicated now. Well, I mean, with you now, but I mean, Roger uh, and, uh, you know, some other people across the country that have gone out and uh, been, you know, at the forefront of that. Yeah. If there's ever going to be a history written, you know, um, Toronto is going to figure prominently in this. Um, I never thought that I would be, I never imagined when I got into AA or um, recovery in general or ever, anything that I would be um, so influenced by these people in Toronto who I not never would have been able to, to, to know if it weren't for the internet. Now, I met them all in Santa Monica um, when I was at that first conference in 2014 but I stayed in touch with them after that online. And I don't think that there's anybody that has influenced me more than that group of people. And that would be Roger and Joe and Larry and many others um, in, in that in that one city. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, this whole thing, uh, if, you, if you really think about it, uh, I'm, in fact, you know, this whole podcast that I'm doing, I wouldn't be doing, if it, doing this if it weren't for Roger from Hamilton, Ontario. Yeah, no, no. I listened to your uh, <laughs> to your intro on that, and uh, I think that's an interesting, you know, twist and turn of events as well. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So, well, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Could you do me one little favor, though, if you could? And the, and the article that you talked about that you wrote on for A Agnostica, you mentioned that you might want to speak um, write a little bit more detail about a particular person. His name is Doctor Jordan Peterson. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So what's the deal? Well, I mean, this is the other thing, too, that I'm excited to talk to you about and reached out to. And I would love to even have a conversation with Joe eventually on that, on this perspective, because the secular um, a movement sort of arose at a period when the uh, the new atheist movement was really kicking. Oh, off yeah. As well. Yeah, you're right. Right. Yeah. And um, and I mean, I, you know, obviously I read Sam Harris and I was yeah. a big, you know, uh, I was influenced by those books. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, and even Bill White and um, um, Ernie Kurtz have written quite a few pa- uh, papers where they kind of were piggy, not necessarily piggybacking, but they were using them as a, as a sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a cultural or historical moment to kind of go out and unpack what was been going on within some of the fellowships. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, fascinatingly, I mean, how I came across uh, Jordan Peterson's work is because of his very public kind of debate that he had with Sam Harris. So, that, I mean, and it was, it was a very highly publicized and controversial sort of, of, of debate because of obviously uh, Sam's, um, 
you know, history with the, uh, the new atheist movement. And now with Jordan Peterson, you know, even though he's a clinical psychologist and he doesn't say that he is particularly religious in any way, shape or form, um, that he's very interested in going out and exploring, uh, you know, what is the idea of myth or, or the idea of, of religion in terms of going out and playing a role uh, within a sort of healing or within his own kind of clinical practice and area of specialization. And uh, what I find fascinating and the reason why I brought it up is that a lot of people don't know uh, about uh, uh, Jordan Peterson is that, I mean, his area of specialization is actually in alcoholism. <laughs> And to, that to me was fascinating. And I was like, well, one, you know, what are the chances of, you know, kind of this Canadian kind of clinical psychologist going out and hitting the scene and going out and on this kind of very public uh, lecture tour and attracting a lot, a lot of young people to him. And a lot of them are talking about, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol. Right. And they're talking a lot about in terms of his idea of recovery. Um, but I mean, Anybody that's read the news around Jordan Peterson, I mean, it's extremely controversial. I mean, he's a very controversial sort of figure. Uh, I mean, he's been, uh, you know, dragged into all kinds of controversy in terms of, uh, in Canada, in terms of, um, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, it, it, anybody that goes and just Googles uh, Jordan Peterson, I mean, you'll go and find an endless slew of, of controversies and, and things that have been written about him. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought this was kind of an interesting kind of, uh, I guess, figure or controversial figure to, for me to go and think about, is he going to go out and have a sort of impact on recovery communities or um, the way kind of uh, Sam Harris has? And, and I, you know, I left, I left it just very open uh, at the end of the article to go and see what kind of reaction or what kind of, you know, talk or if it was going to go and create any kind of, of conversation. And some of the feedback that I've gotten has been really <laughs> I mean, uh, very uh, positive and uh, go figure. I mean, extremely negative as well, right? Uh, from people in recovery. Uh, but I mean, I, I was just kind of curious to see, you know, like, um, you know, how, how is this going to go up and play out in the larger culture? Um, I mean, another one that it was really, I find fascinating in terms of, uh, is Dr. Mate. Um, he's done a lot of, uh, of great work, uh, in the area of addiction and recovery. Um, and I think he had a big impact as well with one of your other guests on your, uh, your show, uh, the gentleman who, uh, kind of spearheaded the recovery 2.0. Oh um, yeah. Tommy Rosen. Tommy Rosen. I mean, he's gone out and done some very kind of sort of public events with uh, with Tommy Rosen, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and how um, more kind of uh, well, you know, Tommy even Tommy Rosen is an interesting character. He is. Talk about. I was so thrilled that I actually got to do a podcast with him. He's something else. <laughs> yeah, he's a very nice person yeah. too, by the way. Oh, he's. I mean, I, the, from what I've seen in terms of his videos, uh, is you know, a fascinating character as yeah. well. I mean. He, and, it, and his own personal story of recovery is, is an unbelievable one. Yeah. People go his first drug was uh, sugar. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's amazing. I do like him a lot. Um, yeah, I, I, that, was a, that, was a, that was wonderful that he would do that anyway. So, I mean, that's, I mean, and that's, I guess, a question I'd, I'd throw back at you. I mean, in terms of your own personal involvement with the, uh, the new atheist movement, how, how much of an impact uh, has it had in terms of the secular AA movement in general? Would you say this had it fairly? Yeah, it, it, I know if other people are like me. So in my case, I was never a religious person, didn't grow up in a religion. But um, for 25 years, I think AA was my religion, okay? And I would... Um, in these AA meetings, I knew the language of the 12 steps and I knew how to, um, you know, get along in that group. But I read the God delusion and I read, um, God is not great. And, um, oh gosh, some other books by the new atheist. And, and after reading those books, I just came to the conclusion that yes, I am an atheist. And, Oh man. And not only did I just read those books, but I started watching YouTube videos and documentaries and all, I just really got absorbed in it. In it. 
and it did change my thinking. Um, I really started looking at what I was doing in AA from a more critical point perspective, and I changed my language that I was using. And that language that I, the new language that I was using as an atheist and the way that I was looking at the steps wasn't um, that well accepted at my original group that I'd been going to for so many years. That's why I I started a group in Kansas City, a secular group. And I think that that has been a common thread is that something happens where, you know, I think that, I think for a lot of us, we don't really identify as atheist or agnostic or anything until something happens that kind of forces us to take a position, you know. (laughs) <laughs> and then from there, because it's usually because we're faced with some sort of dogmatism that that we just can't abide by, and then we start a we start a group. But what's really interesting about all that, though, too, what I'm noticing from my own community here in Kansas City is that there's just a growing acceptance, so that it's completely normal for atheists and agnostics to have their own AA group here, and it's just it's not. You know, there's no, it's there's no controversy. There's no debating or arguing. You know, each person can have their own view, and that's that's one of the strengths of AA, by the way, that you do have those autonomous groups. Anyway, that's kind of a long-winded answer or response to your question. <laughs> but I mean, that was one of the reasons why I was particularly excited to go out and have a conversation with you uh, is to go out and explore some of those, you know, kind of historical things that went out and influenced you guys to go out and start the uh, the secular uh, AA movement. I, you know, I mean, because even when Sam Harris, I think that one of the first books that he wrote was actually a letter to a Christian. Yes, age. I read that. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's an interesting kind of uh, book uh, in itself in terms of how it plays into the history of the United States. Uh, I mean, in Canada, I mean, even that is an interesting question for me to go and kind of explore. You know, I'm hoping to go and explore uh, a bit more. I mean, through some of my other writing or even just through conversations like this is, you know, is, is, is the, I mean, Canada is not as religious as the United States. I mean, it's just much, much more of a secular sort of nation. Uh, I mean, and if people are religious, I mean, they're not as religious publicly. Um, and that to me is, is you know, uh, is an, is an interesting historical, I think, factor, to, you know, in terms of how it goes out and plays in within kind of recovery communities as well. Um, you know, and Joe, Joe's uh, talk I thought was fascinating because he was saying that he's originally from Montreal, and how Montreal is kind of a very free-floating sort of, of uh, community. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm from Montreal, and I, and I totally agree. I mean, uh, because of what happened historically as well in Quebec, because of the quiet revolution with the church and stuff like that, I mean, most uh, Montrealers or people that are from Quebec, I mean, we're not religious usually in terms of any way, shape, or form. So when you do go out into AA or when you go into some of these, you know, other mutual aid uh, kind of uh, support groups in the area of Montreal or kind of just pretty much across the province, they much they are much more uh, secular in terms of its approach, um, you know. But I mean, to me, uh, I've been interested. I mean, one of my main interests is in history, and I'm fascinated by you know questions of religion as well, um, and that's a tension that. If, you know, anybody that spent any time around the addiction treatment and recovery space, um, eventually you kind of come up or you rub up against that, those questions, right? As one is what is science and what is religion and what is their impact on the idea of healing or recovery? Um, but I mean, it's, it's also the, the, the question of religion. I mean, why is religion keep popping back in there? Um, you know, the idea of spiritual experiences or spiritual awakenings or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating kind of, of, of topic to go out and explore and talk about. And, um, I mean, and I mean, even just personally, I mean, as somebody that's, you know, like, uh, like I said, I mean, I end up in an A and we, you know, obviously people that are in an A, it's, it's a lot, but much more than just alcohol. It's about drugs, Right. And most people that are in an A, I mean, they'll actually go and talk about it quite a bit. Is I mean, they're mind-altering chemicals, but a lot of people actually had some kind of altered states of consciousness, or have had weird experiences, uh, whether it be on drugs or even alcohol. That you know, that they're trying to go and recapture all the time. 
right? Which is the basis of addiction. You know, people get addicted to that chasing, that feeling, or that whatever that that experience they originally had when they, you know, when they experimented with drugs or alcohol and eventually got addicted on it. So, and now as well, I mean, anywhere you go out and, uh, I mean, Sam Harris in case in point is an interesting character because if you read some of his work, uh, you know, he's very interested in the idea of, uh, kind of the, uh, psychedelic. Kind yeah, of yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. what, what do the psychedelic sorts of medicines and chemicals, uh, what do they actually go out and offer people and uh, can they actually go out and be used as some form of medicine, uh, to help people. So, you know, the, the, to me, these are all fascinating <laughs> questions. Uh, you know, and I tried to lay some of them out and the two pieces that I, I, I put out there, but I mean, it's, it's difficult to go out and put into writing. Yeah. But, I mean, those oh, are you did a great all job, subjection though. topics. Yeah. Well, I think you're fascinating. I'd love to have you back on another podcast and we can kind of really delve into some of this deeper. And if you'd like to talk more about, you know, the secular AA movement and the history behind it, and, and I'd be gl- glad to do that too. So oh, absolutely. Um, you're yeah. just a very yeah. interesting guy and I, I love your writing. Um, that article that was posted at AA Gnostica was really excellent. And there's also not only was the article itself good, but there's a lot of really interesting links from that article that people should check out because I read some of that information, too. And I learned a lot, you know, just from that little exposure that that you gave us there on Agnostica. So thank you for putting that out there. I appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I mean, and I I really hope that, you know, this could possibly be, you know, an ongoing conversation. I mean, uh, I wasn't too sure in terms of us connecting over a podcast. You know, I had a feeling we were going to go and talk about a lot of subjects, uh, but you know, it'd be fun to go out and just kind of do conversations on, on any one of the subjects that we touched upon at some point, and uh, uh, you know, we uh, dive in a little deeper. And it, it, it's a great excuse, I think, for me as well to go out and uh, um, to explore my writing. I mean, anybody that I think that <laughs> being in recovery ourselves, I think we can go and openly say, you know, a big part of our recovery is, is, is a certain amount of writing, but it's also going out and sharing it and exploring those, those subjects and topics in further depths with other people. And, uh, you know, we find uh, some great gems in there somewhere along the way. All right. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate uh, you taking this time and I will definitely uh, be in touch with you again for another one someday. All right. Sounds great. Yeah, thanks, John. Okay. Really appreciate the conversation. Well, that's it for another episode of AA Beyond Belief. Thank you so much for listening. Hey, if you'd like to help out our site and podcast, there's a couple of things you might want to do. First of all, go on over to iTunes and leave us a review, hopefully a good one. And if you'd like to help us out financially, you can do that too. Simply visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Belief to make recurring contributions as small as a dollar. Or you can uh, make recurring or one-time donations through PayPal at paypal.me slash aabeyondbelief. Or just visit our website, aabeyondbelief.org, and click on the donate button. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back again real soon with another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast.